We've got tons of other GPU news today, but let's start by clearing this up. I've even been seeing this commented on, like in the comment section on my videos. All of that, what is this about? I guess let's read the headline first. So there's a lot of sites reporting on this, and we'll get to the, the original source of this and everything, but rumors allege AMD shipped unfinished RDNA 3 Navi 31 A0 GPU silicon in Radeon RX 7900 series. Now, what does this mean exactly? Well, first of all, A0 silicon is basically, uh, when you first make the design, that's your A0, right? It hasn't gone up to the B yet or, or any revisions like a one. Basically, they're saying it's the first one off the, sh off the, you know, off the presses was like, okay, ship that. Whereas a lot of times there's problems with the silicon that need some small revisions. You might have an A1 or something like that that solves some problems. Well, so that's what they mean by this, is that basically it was the first time through and that it was unfinished. Now, what are they saying doesn't work? Well, this all apparently seems to be coming from Kepler. Now, Kepler on Twitter has um, been known for leaking information about hardware. And one of the sources I think Kepler often uses is the actual code for drivers, things like that. And that's where this is coming from. Is this coming from the Mesa 3D? Um, and when you dig through this, you see this, this code here. And it's saying, return zero for some A0 chips only, other chips don't need it. And this is unsigned SI git shader prefetch size. So then Kepler says, uh, so AMD decided to release Navi 31, A0 silicon, which is known to have a non-working shader prefetch hardware. Now, this would be a huge deal if it was true, because shader prefetch is a really big deal. You might be like, what is a shader and what is a prefetch? Okay, well, I'm not like a, a GPU engineer or any of that, but the basic idea is shaders are uh, tiny little programs that are running on your GPU cores. And then the shader prefetch is a really big deal because, you know, after, after you run one shader, you need to run the next thing after that. And if you have it already fetched, like right there in the cache or whatever it is, just right there to run next, that's a lot faster than, okay, you finished this one and now we go find the next one. If the next one's already there waiting for you, that's a really big deal. And I think a lot of speed ups in GPUs and CPUs in recent years um, have been actually from improving things like pr uh, shader prefetch, prefetching the stuff, as well as, you know, branch chain prediction, all of that. But again, I'm more of a hobbyist, int I'm interested in this, I'm not a complete expert on all of that. But basically, it would be a really big deal if shader prefetch wasn't working and they were shipping hardware with that. However, AMD has responded to this now, and so I wanted to make sure I brought this to everybody's attention. I want to start with what was the big problem, <laughs> um, and then is it is it true? Well, according to Tom's Hardware, <clears throat> AMD has responded and says, like previous hardware generations, shader prefetching is supported on RDNA 3, as per, and then they link to GitLab, uh, the code in question controls an experimental function which was not targeted for inclusion in these products and will not be enabled in this generation of product. This is a common industry practice to include experimental features to enable exploration and tuning for deployment in a future product generation. So what are they saying? They're basically saying that Kepler has misinterpreted this. This is not, uh, apparently there is running shader prefetch and that this is just something else that they were, you know, is, is not intended for this, but just the fact that that isn't working doesn't mean that shader prefetching in general isn't working, which would have been a big deal. Now also, there again, with the big deal about this being the A0 revision, um, AMD is apparently saying that, um, you know, they use A0 stepping of the RDNA 3 silicon, which is fine. That basically means that their engineers developed silicon that was working on the first try. Great. That's what you want to do. And so if it's working, great. Now, again, if it really did have broken shader prefetching, that would have been a problem, but they're saying it didn't. Um, and according to this Tom's Hardware article, they're saying that they actually used um, A0 silicon in... Uh, almost all of the 6000 series and 5000 series GPUs as well. 
So um, th basically that's not indicative of it being an unfinished product. Uh, it just means you got it right on the first try, <laughs> which is kind of the point. Now, let's stay at Tom's Hardware for a second with some good news. So a while back, I've reported on, and I've seen it been going around a number of places as well, that GPU prices could go up by as much as 25% next year because of the um, tariff exemption expiring, but it's looking like that's getting extended at least for another nine months. So, according to Tom's Hardware, GPUs are safe for now. Now, this is all going into a whole bunch of stuff that I don't need to dive into here, but basically there's tariffs on certain electronics and all of that, um, but it's looking like certain ones had exemptions. The exemption that applied to GPUs was going to expire, but it's looking like um, it is being extended, at least um, according to the Tom's Hardware article here. I have not dug into every little uh, detail of all of the tariff law and whatnot myself, <laughs> anyway. Um, however, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, GPUs. How about we, the uh, RTX 4070 Ti showing up in Geekbench? So again, the 4070 Ti, while not officially confirmed by NVIDIA, is a pretty well-known or, you know, not, not well-kept secret. Basically, we've already had <clears throat> its full specs leaked by several AIB manufacturers. It's basically seems to just be the 4080 12 gigabyte that got unlaunched, being rebranded as a 4070 Ti. Um, but since we never got the 4080 12 gigabyte in our hands, we don't know exactly how it performs. So it is interesting to see benchmark leaks. This is a Geekbench 5 score, and um, it looks like the OpenCL test has it um, performing slightly below a 3090 Ti. <clears throat> a little bit above a 7900 XTX and a little bit above a 3090, uh, with a pretty significant step down compared to the 4080, and then um, a huge step down compared to the 4090. Now, again, this is just the open CL test. And if you're wondering, ooh, is, does this mean the 4070 Ti is gonna beat a 7900 XTX? I will have you keep in mind that when we saw um, Geekbench scores leak for the 7900 XTX, in its OpenCL numbers, it was losing pretty heavily like we see here to the 4080, but in other tests within the Geekbench suite, um, it was beating the 4080, and remember in overall rasterized performance, in full reviews, we did end up seeing the 7900 XTX ahead of the 4080. So I would not read too far into this and say, oh, the 4070 Ti is definitely going to tie or beat a 7900 XTX. I think it's going to depend on what you're doing with it, like ray tracing, for example, all of that. Now, speaking of the 7900 XTX and 7900 series in general, there's been a lot of information going around about the overclocking. Uh, for example, we have the Jay's Two Cents video from yesterday um, saying 7900 XTX VRAM issue leads to huge performance loss help. So why don't we talk about this and then talk about some uh, other information I've come across regarding overclocking these things. So what Jay is basically noticing in this video is that while he can push the clock speeds incredibly far, he goes well past 3000 uh, megahertz, so way past three gigahertz, um, what happens though is that performance drops and that in and of itself is not necessarily unusual as you get past the stability of, of your overclock. You always need to test not just are your numbers getting bigger, but is the performance actually increasing? But they noticed in the video that as the number, uh, when that happens, you can sometimes see the VRAM tuning, the VRAM speeds dropping as the GPU is getting pushed um, to really high core clocks and that being a little bit weird. And um, Jay's mentioning in the video, like, is anybody talking about this? So I went looking for other, um, other overclocking results uh, for the 7900 XTX, and I found PowerUp has, uh, Tech PowerUp has reviewed a couple of um, third-party uh, GPUs as well as the original reference models and does go into overclocking them and talk a bit about the process. And while not specifically mentioning the VRAM dropping, um, does mention a, a similar thing happening where as the clock speeds increase, 
um, the performance might actually go down, but is saying he's getting better results on these um, non-reference designs that have the three the three pin a uh, three eight pin power connectors. Now, uh, the result here is saying that um, basically on the AMD reference cards, in, as well as these other cards, changing the GPU clock does nothing for performance or even results in a loss of performance. Um, and again, there's that loss of performance. Now, didn't seem to notice the VRAM dropping, or at least didn't state that as being why, but that does seem consistent. It says, or it crashes the card when set too high. Well, I mean, that's normal. You can crash the card if you go and go too far on your GPU clocks. Um, but it's saying that on the 3.8 pin, things are a little bit different. It's saying due to increased power limit, the GPU frequency slider can actually help. Now, this is similar to what Jay noticed, which is just sliding the um, power limit up to the fit plus 15% max um, does help. And, and Jay was, was good with that too. Now, what Tech Power Up suggesting is, well, since the core clocks aren't really doing anything for you, what you should do is after you increase the power limit, you just find your stable memory clock. So you wanna overclock the memory as far as you can, but once again, monitor the performance because the memory can become unstable um, as you're pushing the performance there and you might not see visual corruption, but performance goes down. And this is something that I see a lot of people get wrong uh, when they're overclocking their GPUs is they just play around getting the numbers as high as they can um, for the clock speeds on memory and core, uh, as long as things aren't crashing or and they're not seeing any vi visual artifacts, but they're not checking every little bit they're pushing it. Um, is their performance continuing to increase or is it starting to decrease? And that's the, the, the big deal here. Um, so basically make sure you're pushing the memory as far as you can without losing performance or stability. Now, um, then Tech Power Up is, is suggesting, then you can start undervolting until you lose stability. Um, and then, you know, playing around with that. Now we don't need to go through the entire uh, quote here, but basically notice similar issues where the, cl the core clocks aren't really helping um, and performance can drop very quickly as you push the core clocks, but saying if you target the, uh, the memory, you could actually get a pretty big performance jump. And if you look at the, the results um, from that, seeing um, a 6.7% actual performance gain um, in uh, Unigen Heaven, and then in Cyberpunk 2077, um, seeing an 8%, uh, well, sorry, um, uh, not an 8% gain, but seeing it come in 8% faster than the 4080 at stock, um, but seeing the overclocked version to come in 11.9% faster. And then um, if you adding on the OC and undervolt on top, so that was just the Sapphire Nitro compared to the reference, adding in the OC and undervolt on top, getting 21.5% faster than the RTX 4080. So it's looking like um, you can push these pretty far. It's just going to involve going as far as you can on the memory and being careful about that. Tech Power Up had very similar results on their XTX Tough OC. Um, I think in this one, using the same process, ended up being 23.1% um, faster than the 4080 if you're looking at it that way. Or you can look at it compared to itself without the, uh, the OC, getting up to 69.2 nice FPS instead of 62.7. Uh, without that OC on it. And again, both those being a lot faster than the 60.8 of the um, the reference spec uh, model. So it looks like you can get places with the overclocking, but that looks like a real issue. Be very careful when you are doing it uh, if you have one of these things. Now, let's jump back over to NVIDIA for a second here and talk about pricing. It's looking like the 4080 price is dropping below its MSRP in Europe in quite a few places. However, this really isn't so much a price cut as just that the dollar is uh, decreasing in value versus the, the Europe. In other words, the, the Europe is strength, Euro is strengthening versus the dollar, however you want to think about it. Um, the point is that uh, we're seeing reports of 4080s 
uh, discounted to below their original MSRPs. But again, if you think about the value of the euro versus the dollar, is that really a price cut? I don't know. But if you had the same amount of money and your euro now buys you more than it used to before, that's pretty good. Here's uh, the videocards.com article showing um, the US dollar to euro value um, over the past little bit. And you can see that it's uh, the, the dollar is dropping um, versus the euro uh, in the last little bit here. Anyway, speaking of the 4080 though, and um, most people, even with the, those decreases, you know, uh, would consider the 4080 to still be too expensive. We are seeing reports of the 4080 topping the GPU bestseller list at Newegg, um, with the 4090 coming in, um, I think it was third place, depending on when you looked. Um, and the 3060 Ti coming in, uh, actually, according to this one, it's looking like uh, 4080 in first place. I guess we could probably zoom in on this a bit more. 4080 in first place, 3060 Ti in second, 3060 in third, and the 4090 coming in fourth here. And depending on when you look. Now, one thing I'll say is, you know, the different models here, I think, might be being tracked separately. So if you maybe if you did an aggregate of each GPU, like all 3060s or all 3060 Ti's, maybe this would play out differently versus this just being uh, the number one here. Also, Amazon is reporting very different results. Apparently, if you look at uh, Amazon, the RTX 3060 is the highest selling graphics card. Um, and the 4080 and 4090 are way farther down in, uh, with the 4090 in 15th position and the 4080 down in 28th place. So we're seeing extremely different results on Amazon uh, versus on Newegg for how, how well these are selling. Now, why could that be? I mean, there's so many reasons. I mean, one could be that maybe people who go to buy at Newegg are more enthusiasts, and because Newegg is more of a PC specialized site, uh, whereas Amazon might be just more general interest, you know, that could affect it, or how many of each model each of them uh, has to sell in the first place. Who knows? Anyway, um, in other news, we're seeing benchmarks leaked for the 13900KS and seeing it directly compared to the 13900K. Now I'm seeing this in a videocards.com article, but their source appears to be Chilled Dog once again. And Chilled Dog has already, which I've reported on my previous video, eh, slide out of the way, um, given us these similar tests. This apparently is from a, a motherboard manufacturer testing their own products uh, against each other so they would have the upcoming chips and testing against them, presumably on the same motherboard. Now, what we're seeing here are Cinebench scores, both single core and multi-core. And what we're seeing is the single and multi-thread scores being 5% and 3% faster, respectively, on the 13900KS compared to the 13900K. And, you know, that's not a massive difference, and I'm imagining that they're gonna charge a pretty large um, price jump. <laughs> over the original uh, original model, we'll see. Um, but you always pay uh, diminishing returns to get the best of the best, or at least that used to always be the case until the 4090 and GPUs started apparently being better value than the lower end models. Not because it's good value, but because they just started giving us even worse values. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. The point is, um, in this WCCF Tech article on the topic, you can also see these Cinebench scores stacked up against some other CPUs. So that 13900KS result was at 2.4, um, whereas the 13900K was at about 2.2. We're seeing like 7950X at about 2.1. Um, so you can kind of see how that stacks up. Now for gaming performance, it's the single uh, core that would matter the most, but you could also look at the multi-core performance here. Um, where the 7950X is coming in uh, a lot closer, at least, to those results. Now, from AMD, we would be expecting some CPU updates. The most exciting ones, I think, for most people would be the X3D, or the, well, maybe not for most people, for enthusiasts, gaming performance enthusiasts. Myself uh, would be the 3D V-Cache chips. Um, it's looking like the uh, 7000 non-X CPUs are going to be coming sooner than we see the V-Cache chips. Now, the main excitement here would just be the lower power draws and pricing. However, it's looking like a, um, 
<clears throat> embargoed slide has been leaked and videocards.com has it and that this shows the pricing. So we can see the pricing here. I think they've blurred this out to make it less identifiable as far as like where the source came from and all of that. So it's kind of blurry looking. Um, but here we see the pricing listed for the 7900 non-X at 429, the 7700 non-X at 329, and the 7600 non-X at 229. Now the other interesting thing here is that these look like they will come with stock coolers. The X versions this time around did not come with stock coolers, whereas like the 5600X from the previous generation did come with a stock cooler. And for someone who's planning on using that cooler, um, that can be a 20 to $30 worth of savings um, to buying a, a separate cooler. So that actually can be kind of a big deal. Now, when you look at these compared to the MSRPs, that um, seems like a big discount, but when you look at it compared to what the, G, what the uh, X versions are actually selling for right now, it's not as big of a discount. So that's actually less exciting. Um, in other words, the 7600X, for example, has a $300 MSRP. So the 7600 non-X coming in at $230 seems like a really good deal relatively until you factor in the reality of the situation, which is the 7600X is actually selling for around $250 since a little bit before Black Friday, we got some discounts that never went away. Uh, same thing with the 7700X, that version's at 400 MSRP and the non-X will come in at 330, um, but the actual price is really more like 350 on the X version. So that's again, not that big of a discount. And again, same thing happening at the high end where we're seeing the 7900 non-X coming in at 430, which is great compared to the MSRP of 550 on the X version, but, the, but it's actually selling for closer to 440, making that only like a $10 difference. And I accidentally just closed out that article. Well, whatever. Anyway, uh, let's move on. I'm just basically saying I think that it would be more exciting if they had actually um, <clears throat> Uh, done a steeper discount. I actually, I'm, I'm worried that they might increase the X pricing because they always said that those price drops on the X versions were temporary. I wonder if what they mean is they'll go back up after they launch the non-X versions to be the more price competitive version. I don't know. We'll see what happens. Now, um, in GPU news, we're seeing Gigabyte quietly starts shipping Intel Art graphics cards. Now, this is interesting because this makes Gigabyte now the first uh, add-in board partner to make GPUs for AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA, which is interesting. The other interesting thing I'm seeing here is that it's looking like Gigabyte is selling these in Russia and Kazakhstan, which... Um, I thought we had embargoes happening uh, for this kind of technology in Russia, but apparently there's ways around that or something. I don't know, but interesting stuff, although it's not looking like they, they're going with the ARC A750 or A770 yet. It looks like they're sticking to the ARC A310 uh, and 380 uh, as their, their ones they're, they're targeting here. Now, in other cooler models and all that, we're seeing Asus's ROG Strix white GPUs uh, coming out. So we usually get a white version of the Strix eventually, and it's looking like that's being shown off here. And the Strix cards always look nice, and I do have a white build right now, um, but I probably shouldn't be buying another 4090. <laughs> now, we don't get a white PCB, although we do get a white backplate and all of that. Um, remember we did see the, um, from Galax, we saw, I wonder if there's a picture of it in this article too. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, he, uh, no, no, not in this article, but Galax did have a white model that I think also had a white PCB. So if you wanted to go even more all white, uh, <laughs> I guess you could. Now, uh, technically there's four versions of this because you have the 4080 and the 4090, and then there, for each of those, it has one that ships with a factory overclock and one that doesn't. So, but other than that, I think the cooler models and all that are pretty much the same. In other uh, GPU cooler designs, we see Yeston with their uh, Sakura series on the 7900 being announced. And so if 
you're really looking for the anime style uh, GPU cooler, I guess uh, Yeston uh, will have you covered there. Now we're seeing MS. Uh, we're seeing a lot of people question like, "Hey, where are the MSI 7900s?" Well, it's looking like they won't be coming until sometime in in quarter one, 2023. They just didn't have them ready for launch, and it looks like it's being reported that they're skipping the made by AMD reference designs and will just be coming in with their own coolers. Um, so if you're keeping your eye out for the MSI designs, looks like quarter one. Now in further AMD news, we're seeing uh, the AMD Radeon Twitter account announcing how good FSR adoption has been. So with, um, it looks like over 230 games support FSR. I think a lot of people are more excited for the FSR 2 implementation. Well, that looks like it's already 101 games having support. Um, and they got this big, uh, you know, a shot here with all these games with FSR 2 support, which is pretty cool. Honestly, um, it's nice to see adoption uh, going quickly. They're also announcing right here um, that uh, there's going to be a new 3D, 3D Mark uh, test, which is a feature test for FSR 2.2 to compare the different quality modes and all of that. Now, in other related news, well, not related to that specifically, but in GPU-related news, NVIDIA's Shield TV will be losing game stream for PC streaming in a coming update. Now, for some people, I don't think this was used by a ton of people, but I think for some people it was one of the main selling points for Shield TV. Now, if you're un unfamiliar with what this is, it's basically streaming games off your local PC that had an RTX card in it, an NVIDIA card in it, um, streaming it to your NVIDIA Shield uh, to play on your TV or whatever. Kind of a cool feature, similar to Steam Link, things like that, but I've heard it worked better than Steam Link. Now, with this disappearing, NVIDIA is suggesting, well, you could just stream from the cloud with GeForce Now. In other words, when we're wondering why are they doing this, why are they removing a feature, um, one could speculate it's to try to sell more GeForce Now subscriptions, <laughs> but they're also suggesting you could switch to using the Steam Link API. Now, I'm not an expert on local game streaming, but I've heard that Moonlight offers better, uh, better, it's a better service than uh, Steam Link and, and is kind of like, in, in other words, don't necessarily jump straight to Steam Link. Look into Moonlight. I haven't used it myself, but I've heard really good things. Uh, so just throwing that out there for anyone that this is affecting. Now, um, Tesla's AMD Navi 23 based infotainment system can now run thousands of Steam games. So basically Tesla's infotainment system has an RX 6600M in it. And it's looking like it is now uh, up and running for Steam games. So if you want to take distracted driving to a whole new level, there you go. <laughs> um, in other news on portable gaming, because <laughs> I guess a car is portable gaming, right? Um, well, how about Steam Deck competitors? With the One X Player 2 gaming console with AMD Ryzen 7 6800U CPU, uh, coming in at $900, pre-order starting on December 18th, and I believe this um, has a Radeon 680M inside of it as far as the graphics goes, um, which um, recently I tested out in a tiny little mini PC, I mean not really a handheld PC, but uh, it had a 680M in it, um, got some decent 1080p gaming performance on the thing, so this is pretty interesting. Now, speaking of Steam Deck news, sorry guys, you can probably tell I have a bit of a cold today, so apologies if my voice is a bit off today. Um, we have a second gen Steam Deck coming, which should surprise nobody, um, but that it's not going to improve performance. That might come, well, definitely will come later, but the next revision is not going to be targeting increasing gaming performance, and that is intentional. So uh, there was an interview with The Verge. Uh, from Steam Deck designer Lawrence Yang uh, prob uh, and Pierre, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna just fail on these names, guys. But the point is, Steam Deck designers. <laughs> uh, they're saying right now the fact that all Steam Decks can play the same games and that we have one target for users to understand what kind of performance level to expect when you're uh, playing, and for developers to understand what to target. There's a lot of value in having that one spec. 
I think we'll opt to keep the one performance level for a little bit longer, and only to look at changing the performance level when there is a significant gain to be had. I think what they're basically getting at here is, let's say you could increase performance by 20%. That's not going to make you suddenly going from playing a game at 30 FPS to 60 FPS, right? It's not going to be some massive uh, performance jump. Whereas it would then make it more complicated for developers to understand how to target their game performance for the Steam Deck. So I really get what they're saying here. And so what they're saying is they, there's other features that could be improved, like the screen or the battery life, things like that. Um, that might be more relevant than um, uh, for a revision than just incremental performance increases and waiting until you can get a massive performance leap uh, to actually do so. And I think that makes sense. Um, when you actually read the full Verge article, I saw an interesting note as well where they were talking about how many people um, they're actually paying to work on the Linux like uh, Mesa drivers and Proton compatibility layer. It sounds like they're paying over like a hundred open source developers to be working on that project. So if uh, if if Linux has made uh, big gaming jumps recently, I think we could thank Valve for a lot of that. It sounds like if I'm understanding um, uh, understanding what I'm reading there. Um, anyway, I'm th this video is long enough. I, sh I shouldn't I was gonna go off on a tangent about Linux gaming, but anyway. Uh, no, seriously, you should disable the 2K launcher for Marvel's Midnight Suns. Hey guys, if you're playing Marvel's Midnight Suns, and I'm not, so I can't confirm this myself, although maybe I should get it, I don't know. Um, it sounds like it's had a lot of stuttering and uh, frame rate problems. And according to Rock Paper Shotgun, although they're not claiming to be the first people to have noticed this, they're saying, if you're playing the Steam version of the game, I strongly suggest following the lead of the thousands of people who've discovered this before me by disabling the 2K launcher entirely. I've just tried this out and not only did the majority of the stuttering vanish, but my average frames per second shot up by nearly 62%. Guys, if, you're, <laughs> if the 2K launcher was really holding back performance by 62%, that, I mean, I don't even know what to say about that. That is just absolutely disgusting. Apparently, um, there's a guide for how to do this through the Steam version of the game, but the Epic version of the game is is more difficult to do or impossible. I don't know. Uh, but they're show, showing some pretty drastically different performance numbers here, going up from an average of 90 to 146, uh, with 1% lows increasing from 20 to 69. Nice. Anyway, great great performance improvement there if you're playing that game. Um, Resident Evil Village VR launches for free alongside PSVR 2, and if you're like me and you're interested, does that mean PC VR incoming? It d did not look like there was any official announcement for a PC version of that um, that I could find, although hopefully it's incoming and just not... Um, being talked about at this moment. And the last thing I'll leave you guys with is RTX Remix. Um, I've reported on this before that people took the code from Portal RTX and have just been dropping it into old games, despite the fact that we don't have the full RTX Remix up and running yet. Uh, but just dropping the code from uh, Portal RTX into old games has seen uh, some interesting results. And while I've reported on other ones already, it's looking like it's also been dropped into Unreal Tournament 2004 and Restaurant Empire 2. Um, and again, getting some uh, interesting screenshots with the uh, path traced lighting and, and all that. So obviously these aren't going to be perfectly uh, working and bug free due to the uh, nature of just dropping that in and we not having the full RTX remix up and running. but. I am excited to see what comes out of RTX Remix, although I wish its um, support for other GPUs would be a little bit better than what we saw in Portal Remix. I hope all of you have an excellent day.